Uh, don't freak out because the name changed. Uh, the original talk uh, that I was asked to give was the one that I gave at the uh, Django mini conference, and I thought, well, you know, how can I uh, make it a little more approachable to the wider Python community, and how can I put a bit more code in there? So what I've done is I've gone and, and added like about another half an hour to a 40-minute talk, and I'm going to do that in 30 minutes. So it's going to go really fast, and it's going to be a lot of different things. And what I'm hoping is that there's something in there for everyone that's something you can take away and try and use, um, no matter whether you're a, a, a web person or a non-web person. Um, OK. So reasons for this talk. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of a history lesson. Um, how many people know Zope here? Have heard of Zope? How many uh, have heard bad things about Zope? Yeah, so that's at least half of those. So I'm going to give uh, a bit of context about what it is and where it came from and some of the cool things that came from it and still around today. Um, and hopefully, as I said, some things you can reuse. Um, so these are all the things I'm going to try and cover. So we'll see how we go. So back. If, you, if you're going to think about the web uh, as, it, as it exists, the Python web, you've got to go back to the original HTTPD. And back then, you had this thing called CGI. How many people were actually programmed in CGI? Excellent. So this is before things like Ruby on Rails and routing and, 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 and the ways we probably mostly do web stuff today. Um, and what you had, you also had this uh, Ruby on Rails explosion where a whole bunch of different frameworks, including Django and Turbo Gears and stuff like that, um, came out of that and that idea of how you build a web application. Um, and a lot of the Python uh, web frameworks that you see today kind of come from that sort of lineage. But in terms of time frame, there was also this whole alternative thing. So back in 1996, really, really early on, uh, there was uh, the Zope framework, which was another way of doing websites. Um, and it had a slightly different idea. Um, and that, you know, they, they had this thing called Zope 3, which then became uh, ZTK, which became Blue Bream, and they kind of really don't, don't ever make a new framework and name it like 3, you know, sort of. That's a really bad idea. Um, because Zope 3 was nothing like Zope 2. Um, Anyway, Plone, I come from the Plone community, which is uh, the biggest Python CMS, unlike what Michael Ford just said. Um, it runs an awful lot of websites in the world, um, and it is a, a true enterprise CMS with a, a crap load of features. Uh, and that has a long lineage that goes back to 1999. Um, and then you've got the advent of kind of micro frameworks, uh, like Flask, which seems to have won out over Bottle in terms of um, being the most popular micro framework. And one thing I want to talk about is this uh, other framework called Pyramid. I don't know how many people have heard of Pyramid. Yep. So Pyramid it was originally called BFG, um, and it brought some of the ideas from the Zoop 3 Zoop toolkit as well as uh, you know, Ruby on Rails and Django, and tried to combine the best of it into something that was really lightweight um, and very, very fast. And then you've actually got these other things like Nicola, things like static um, text generation languages, which are for, for building simple websites. Um, so there's a lot of options now for building stuff on the web. Uh, and the P Python has a, a, a very long history um, with that. So I just want to explain really quickly what Zope was about. The, the original um, Zope came from this idea. This guy called um, Jim Fulton was actually on a, pay, uh, on a plane, and he was going to give... Uh, uh, he was paid to uh, give a tutorial on how to write CGI stuff, and he'd never written CGI before. He actually read the, uh, the, how, the specifications on a plane. He thought, this kind of sucks. I can write something better. So on the, on the plane on the way back, he wrote soap. Um, now, CGI has this idea that you have a path going through folders till you get to a script, and then you execute the script, and then you take the, the rest of the arguments and you do things. So, the idea was, well, what if we can take you know, this path idea and instead of opening folders and files on a disk, what if we had an object database? We pulled things out of the database, and then we, once we got to the end of it, we, the last bit was a method, and then we executed that method. So it was a way of taking a URL and hooking it into code and rendering some HTML. And that uh, was really uh, the basis of Zoop. Um, and when you think about it, it's quite different than the way routes work. Um, if everyone's familiar with the word routes, when you use kind of you know, pattern matching to work out which 
which view to use, say, in Django or Flask or something. Yep. Um, so traversal, I think, is, is one of the first goodies. It's a different way of building a web application. It's actually a really simple idea that you can actually write in a few lines. Um, so it's something that, uh, so let's say you wanted to write a, a really simple traversal mechanism. If you, had, if, you, if you took your path and you split it up, then we had this uh, recursive um, uh, definition here. So we've taken this thing called the context, which is some object. It doesn't have to be a database object, it's just some uh, object. And we initially pass in the root, and that becomes what's called the context. So first thing we do is, if we're at the end of it, we're just gonna call our context with a request, and whatever callable it is, is supposed to render to HTML or whatever the, the publishing environment requires. So if it's a, it's a whiskey app, it should probably render some sort of whiskey response. Um, object. Now let's say if the, the, path, uh, the path was one, that means our context has some kind of method or action that um, you should uh, execute. So in this case, what we do is we, we get that uh, method off that object, uh, and we then execute that method and hopefully get an HTTP response that we can return. And in the last case, what we do is we break that path down, we take the next context by getting the get attribute, um, the get attribute we, we, we treat the object as a dictionary, we pull out the next uh, part of the context, uh, and then we pass that into the traversal with the remainder of the path. So it's a kind of a, a recursive distributed way of resolving a URL to a particular uh, method, uh, which will render HTML. Different way of thinking about web apps. Uh, so why would you want to do that? So typically route type applications, they tend to end up, they, you, you, there are lots of ways of doing routes, you can match them in different ways, but often they end up kind of with a, an action with some kind of ID or some kind of identifier to pull the stuff out of the database, and then you have to do the work to pull the stuff out of the database yourself. Traversal tends to have this kind of more hierarchical sort of thing where your identifiers are at the beginning and then you have your sort of action at the end. Uh, routes tend to be centrally defined. You tend to you know, have a, a, a definition of all the different things that match. Really easy to sort of see your know, application in one sort of glance and what's hooked up to what. Um, on the other hand, uh, traversal's distributed. So it's, what this means is that um, route's really good for sort of single apps that you're building yourself and you understand exactly all the different URLs and, and, and want to have complete control over them. Whereas traversal is really good for applications where you've got uh, lots of content, um, you have uh, plugins, you want different parts of the application to be controlled by different codes, potentially written by other people. Um, so it, it's turned out to be quite a good way of having an application like that. And because you've got this kind of folder hierarchy thing, it actually works quite well for um, content management systems. Um, Next part that came from ZOP was this uh, ZODB. So the ZODB stands for uh, ZOP Object uh, Database. Um, it's kind of, again, goes back to the beginnings of uh, ZOP, which is in the middle of the 90s. So it was NoSQL before all this NoSQL stuff happened. And what it did um, is allowed you to basically take any object and store it. And it's as simple as that. Uh, it takes objects, store them, uh, lets you pull them out. Um, so it's, if you want uh, something that, uh, a lot of NoSQL solutions are kind of key value stores, they're reasonably simple. Um, if you want something that's non-relational, if you have something that has complex object structures, like you have a, a GS, GIS type uh, application where you've created special indexes and things like that, um, the ZODB can uh, take that existing code and a lot easier create a structure that is persisted uh, without having to change a lot of things. Um, so how simple is it? Well, this is an example of adding a bunch of things uh, which are non-relational. We've got, we've got lists in there, we've got dictionaries, we've got dictionaries of lists. Um, uh, 
pretty much, and I haven't even used classes and things like that. So you can create all sorts of structures and just how easy it is to have that um, put into a transaction and stuck into a database. Uh, well, that's the extra bit we need to do. So we've got a little bit of um, adding a file storage at the beginning, um, opening a database, opening a connection to that database, uh, committing it, and then we can close the database at the end if we want, or we can just do another transaction. Um, but it's more than just a simple file storage locally. It has this thing called ZDO, so you can um, replicate it over multiple machines with a network layer. Um, it's got uh, multi-version uh, multi concurrency, version control. Um, it has a lot of stuff. It runs, um, it's what things like Plone run on uh, and consequently runs a lot of websites. Um, so adapters. Adapters is really kind of the core idea behind uh, Zope 3, which became uh, uh, the Zope component architecture, which is ZDK. And adapters aren't necessarily a problem, a solution to a problem that you have every day. Adapters are solving the problem of how to build uh, complicated software that has plugins and you need to uh, structure it. Um, so it's a large software problem. It was a, uh, a kind of an answer to some of the problems that was encountered by making things very object oriented. Um, it tried to get around some of those problems and it works, it works quite well. Um, so, so one of the things is, yeah, it's really good for um, allowing your code to have these plug points where you can say, well, uh, I am designing this specifically to allow uh, this part to be overridden or another implementation to be put in place. Um, so how does it work? Let's say we had, uh, we had this, uh, an interface. So one of the things you get is interfaces. If anyone's familiar with Java or other languages like Go that have interfaces, uh, this is an implementation in Python that's used in not just SOAP, it's used in Twisted and other places as well. Uh, and it is quite fast and it's used for a lot of things as well as uh, just adapters. Um, but let's say we have this uh, plug interface. So this is a, an interface that any object or any class that implements a plug uh, can mark themselves and say, I in, uh, do this interface. Interfaces, uh, these open interfaces, they don't enforce, they don't go and check, they don't uh, have runtime errors that say, uh, you know, they won't, it won't stop your code from running if you don't implement all the different things. But basically it's a promise, it's a thing you can say, well, you know, anyone who implements this should have these methods or attributes in this case. Uh, so let's say I had a phone, uh, and I, Moto X is not available, I'd quite like to buy one if I wanted it. I can't really use uh, the US plug, but it implements the US plug, so uh, I'm kind of stuffed. Uh, and it only has two prongs, it doesn't have three prongs. So let's say I had another interface, which is the New Zealand plug. Uh, also happens to have, you know, the same set of attributes, doesn't have to have the same attributes, it could be like taking, you know, something completely different and turning it into something else. Uh, oh. Right, so what I can do then is I can uh, instantiate my, my Moto X. That's now my phone, I've just bought it. Uh, it has these three prongs. Oh, I'm testing whether it has three prongs. It's false, that's crap because I can't use it here. So I now have a phone that can't be charged. But what I'm gonna do is, uh, I've missed something, yep. I've missed the adapter bit. So this is the adapter bit. I create a class which is an adapter, and what it does is it implements the New Zealand plug and it adapts things that have a US plug. So it takes the US plug uh, type items uh, in its um, constructor, and then it changes that object or uh, maps that object in such a way as to make it uh, more compatible with the New Zealand plug promise. Uh, then you have this register, you register the adapter, um, and then at that point, uh, I can then instantiate that and say, look, what I really want is I want something that will take my, New Ze my phone that I've just bought and make it compatible with New Zealand plugs. And that's what I have. Um, it's a few simple classes. It's, uh, it's all done using um, in some of the base inheritance stuff, so it's actually blindingly fast. And it has all this complex stuff to do with hierarchies and things, so it, it works out what's the best particular adapter in any particular context. Uh, and it has this kind of built-in hierarchy to, w to resolve which adapter should be used. Uh, there's a few other things in ZTK, there's events and, and, and some other stuff as well. 
Um, but that's the coolest idea. Sprints. Not a lot of people know that the sprints came out of the Zoke community, which I thought, uh, this is off the Wikipedia page. Um, and in particular, the Clone community I come from, they run uh, many different sprints every single year, and I'm organizing one, uh, the first uh, Plone sprint in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and it's gonna, it's a bit of an experiment. We're gonna do it uh, online, because we're all ge geographically split out. There'll be some New Zealanders involved, some Australians. We're doing Philippines, uh, Thailand, uh, Jakarta, uh, Malaysia, and America as well. Um, so we'll see how that goes. That's next weekend. So Pyramid, uh, how many people use Pyramid here? Oh, cool, few people. So Pyramid does not advertise itself as a micro framework, and, and this upsets me a little bit. I remember uh, um, Richard Jones gave a talk on um, uh, micro frameworks a couple of years back, and he deliberately included, didn't include it because uh, they didn't advertise it and they didn't want to be known as a micro framework. But, one of the tenets of a micro framework is that you can uh, write it in one page, and you can do that uh, with Pyramid. Um, there's maybe one or two extra lines that you might have to write if you, uh, compared to Flask, but some of those lines are actually a couple of indirections that really help you build complicated, uh, more complicated applications. So I think Pyramid is a really good choice because you're not gonna get stuck uh, Try, it's got some constructs in there that really help you build bigger applications. Uh, and it also uh, comes out blindingly fast. So. Uh, so that's an example of, you know, obviously you wouldn't necessarily write that. We're doing the whole whiskey configuration thing at the same time, but that is an entire application that will return JSON. Uh, So it has a bunch of other things, um, maybe that uh, you wouldn't necessarily get in some of the other ones. Um, it's got this idea of extensibility. It also has this traversal stuff in it. Um, the authorization, the um, authentication and security system is quite nice. It's quite granular and it's kind of built in. Um, it has those things called interfaces, but it also has all the route stuff and it has a lot of uh, neat rules for being able to um, define the kind of URLs that you wanna uh, associate with code. Uh, so that's it using traversal, also one page. So build out, how many people use build out or heard of build out? A few, cool. So build out's another thing that came out of the uh, Zoop community. And build out is kind of hard to explain. I think you kind of have to use it, but it's taking um, a lot of these different sort of tools uh, and, and putting it into one. And uh, it allows, what it really does is, um, is it allows you to have a single definition that you can give to a developer and say, run build out, and you will have all of your environment set up all in one place. And you can do that in multiple directories. You can have, um, without having to play with system packages, uh, you can have things that aren't Python in there. You can say, we, we deploy a, um, our production build out um, that includes things like MySQL, compiles it um, with our special patches, compiles, um, Things like, uh, yeah, LDAP libraries, uh, memcached, all sorts of stuff, varnish, hard proxy. We've got it all in there, our entire stack, all defined in a few set of files and completely replicatable in different contexts. Um, very, very um, cool. Uh, I think of it kind of like gaffer tape. You know, it really sticks together, you know, uh, the world isn't perfect, not everything's written in Python. Sometimes you need to have a more complex application and this makes it all stick together. They, they, uh, they show up here, they were about Plone. So Plone is, um, is an enterprise grade uh, CMS built on top of Zoke 2. It runs a lot of websites including um, the FBI main site. Um, it has excellent security reason which is possibly why it runs on the FBI site. Uh, it, uh, also ran the CIA site, um, and to our knowledge, none of these sites have ever been hacked. In fact, uh, no unpatched clone system has ever been hacked to anyone's knowledge. And it, and it does that for a few, uh, few different ways. It has a, a really tight, it's a, essentially the way the application is written, it has row level security. Um, it's hard to get in there and have complete access to the whole database. Um, but it has an awful lot of um, different sort of features, the sort of things that governments, big organizations want 
you know, things like a, a workflow editor built in and it has uh, version um, histories and it has the ability to edit a page and have multiple copies going at once and all sorts of um, stuff. Um, so this is kind of showing how, you know, compared to some others, it actually crosses um, a lot of different lines. It works as sort of a document management sort of system as well as an internal portal. It's really great for intranet. Um, so I would say that it still beats out Drupal in terms of features. Um, it's really good for multi-site stuff. It's easy to install, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm just going to skip over this stuff. So one of the things I want to talk about is um, not everyone uh, needs to use a CMS. Um, and in fact, a lot of people in the Python community don't need to use a CMS. And a lot of people don't understand the differences, I don't think, of why, when to use a CMS versus not. I've seen this a lot in um, the, um, in the Plone community and other communities where people have gone, well, they've tried to take, say, Django or a Lightweb framework and build something that really should be done using a CMS. Or they've taken Plone and they've done something that really should be done using a framework. And to me, the real difference is um, all about separation of concerns. Um, so what a CMS does best is it's an application that's written to have uh, very different roles, have different user experiences. Um, you have the non-technical people, you have people who you can give it to and they're editors and they get to just work on the content. They do what they, they're communications managers, they're people who know how to maybe stick an image up but they don't know how to resize an image, they know how to write content but they don't know how to write HTML. You have things like reviewers and so on uh, who just want to approve it. They don't even know how to use a visual editor or, or what a visual editor is. Um, then you've got more technical people. You've got themers and things. You've got people who don't necessarily understand Python, but they know how to create front-end HTML, and they want to uh, take a design that they've talked to the client about and produce a website. Uh, so CMSs are designed to be customized. They're designed to have whole interfaces and whole subsystems all around uh, taking designs and turning them to websites quickly. Um, because of that, it's a great tool for people who have to turn out websites. Uh, companies like mine where you're given a brief and you say, we want a website to do this, and at the end of it you want a maintainable website that the customer can maintain themselves and they're not coming back to you to say, I'd like to change this word here. Um, that's very different than if you want to create uh, the new startup like Facebook or something like that. If you're using wireframings to work out, you know, the complex interactions and forms and things like that, then you're probably not using a CMS or you probably shouldn't be using a CMS. Having said that, my company does do that things so using a CMS, but that's because we know the CMS, which is why I wanted to talk about this idea of customization cliff. Let's see if this one works. Yes, okay. So the customization cliff, the idea, this is where people get into trouble with CMS versus framework. Because the thing is, right, is that essentially a CMS is like a big framework. There's more stuff in there. There's more stuff to learn. To be competent in a full CMS, whether it be, you know, the ins and outs of customizing WordPress or Drupal or, or Plone, you have to know a lot of things. On the other hand, you, know, you have to know less things to build stuff in, say, Django, but you have to build more stuff because you have less stuff to basically start with. You can't reuse as much stuff. So you, with a framework, you have this kind of... Uh, ability to get more, uh, have to do more work. So the more customization means the more work. Whereas with a CMS, you get a lot of stuff for free for quite a long time, and at one point it crosses over. If you have to customize it too much, you're fighting the framework, and then you're ending up in this position where you probably were better off in, uh, uh, with a lighter weight framework to begin with. So if you're gonna build something that you think is gonna be very, very custom with lots of different forms, and you're gonna have to want complete control over the HTML at every single point, you probably don't want a CMS. The real trick here is that you don't actually know where that point is unless you're really, really competent in both systems. So um, that's what makes it a little bit tricky and that's why I see so many people get into trouble. They think, oh, great, reuse. I can take the system. It does 90% of what I want and then they underestimate how much work that 10% is to actually do and how much knowledge there is required to do it. Diazo. So Diazo is this awesome new uh, theming technology that's uh, Plone uses, and it's a really great idea. Um, it's not a problem everyone has. It's an, old, uh, an alternative way of doing templating. Uh, so instead of, say, Ginger or, or uh, Django templates or something like that, um, 
this has this extra layer. And what it's doing is it's, it's allowing the HTML that's delivered by your front end developers to be untouched. You don't rip it apart. Normally what happens is that someone develops this great, fantastic HTML, then you rip it apart and put all these Python statements and things like that in the middle of it, and you're stuck in this problem whereby the, uh, they want to make changes, then suddenly you know, they might uh, ruin your template. Uh, or they might have to, you know, they can't use the same tools because it might screw up the template. Uh, and you've got, you're slowed down by this process. Um, so it allows us kind of round, round tripping. Um, it also is in itself quite easy to learn. We've taught uh, PHP people, even front end um, developers who don't, uh, who just know CSS, we've taught them the Diosa rules and they can pretty much build a theme by themselves. Um, so it's very accessible, you don't need to know Python. And it works like this, you have an HTML file, uh, which is your theme file, and that's the bit that's delivered by your front end. Then you have something else that produces HTML, like a, a framework or a CMS or something like that, an application that's building lots of different HTML pages, and they're really simple uh, things. And what it does is you use some uh, very simple rules in an XML file, you produce XSLT, you run it through middleware, and suddenly you've got a theme site. Uh, robot framework. Now, this wasn't invented in the Plone community, um, but it's being used quite a bit in the Plone community. And they did invent, uh, they did invent uh, this thing called Robot Suite, which allows Robot Framework to work inside uh, the existing unit test framework, and you can use all your same layers. What it is is it's a, it's a, it's a um, uh, an acceptance test framework, it allows you to do functional tests, it does all the clicking and stuff for you, it doesn't have to be used on the web, it's got stuff to do Windows applications and things like that. It's got this really cool language that allows for extensibility. Um, it's a great testing framework, I think everyone should check it out. And it's not, it's not um, known about that much. Um, Nokia actually produced it. Um, uh, and it's now being used to do um, automated screenshots for Plone manuals, it has this system uh, that we've developed that allows you to sort of take snapshots as you go along. Uh, and that was all I had, I got to the end, that's awesome. <laughs>